Hello, pediatric surgery family. I'm M. Tom Bash, a research fellow from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And today, our team are going to deliver the articles that you should know about. We have four papers today. First three of them are from the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. And the last one is an APSA article of interest and published in Pediatrics. We don't have much time, so let's start. Our first paper titled as Why Do Subcutaneous Ports Get Stuck? A Case Control Study by Krug et al. And this paper is summarized by Ellen and Cisco. She's a research fellow at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. In this study, the authors wanted to find out why some ports get stuck and are difficult to remove. So they did a prospective case control study at their institution between 2014 and 2017. They looked at 57 stuck ports and 171 controls. They found a few differences between the two groups, including that stuck ports were associated with the diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and with a longer duration of port placement. On univariate analysis, they also found an association between stuck ports and subclavian access and polyurethane catheters. So if you need to remove a port and these factors are present, it may be a good idea to keep them in mind and have the endovascular team available as backup. Perfect. Moving to the next one. Our second paper of the day is Major Stoma-Related Morbidity in Young Children Following Stoma Formation and Closure, a Retrospective Cohort Study by Vogel et al. This paper is summarized by Brittany Levy. She's a research fellow at Cincinnati Children's Hospital as well. Pediatric patients are getting stomas for all different reasons and really at all different ages, which means they can have them in place for months to up to years. However, the morbidity for stomas in young children isn't well studied, or at least it wasn't, before Vogel and her team looked into it. So to evaluate this morbidity, the authors looked at 336 children who received a stoma and noted that 27% had a complication like prolapse, high output, or stenosis. In 292 kids, the stoma was reversed, but even still, 23% of them had problems like hernia, piece of disease, or anastomotic complications. So what exactly are we saying? Having a stoma leads to significant implications for these kids that range from multiple admissions, malnutrition, and repeat operations. Therefore, when considering primary anastomosis versus stoma creation, a careful risk-benefit ratio really needs to be evaluated. Great. Let's keep moving. Our third paper is The Natural History of Prenatally Diagnosed Congenital Pulmonary Airway Malformations and Bronchopulmonary Sequestrations by Carlson et al. This paper is summarized by Cecilia Hijena. She's also a research fellow at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. This is a retrospective study made in Stockholm, Sweden from 2002 to 2020. They aimed to study if there was any prognostic factors in prenatal diagnosed CPAMs. And what did they find? They found 66 patients with prenatal diagnosed CPAMs. 56% were reduced during prenatal course. Only 31% of them needed surgery, meaning 69% were managed conservatively. After birth, only 19% developed symptoms. The risk factors for needing a surgery were mediastinal shift on postnatal imaging, high CVR, and large lesion size. So, it seems that not every prenatal diagnosed CPM needs surgery. Great! Now the final paper. Trends in Routine Opioid Dispensing After Common Pediatric Surgeries in the U.S. 2014 to 2019 by Sutherland et al. This one is summarized by Dr. Todd Pansky. He is a pediatric surgeon at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. What's the background and what were they trying to figure out? The background is, you know how we've been reading and hearing about studies that talk about that you don't need to prescribe so much narcotics after pediatric surgery and we should try to decrease the prescribing of narcotics. So they wanted to see if it worked. Did we listen to that? Did we stop prescribing so much narcotics after surgery in children? And the answer is yes. They looked at five years worth from 2014 to 2019 and they saw a substantial decrease in both prescriptions and filling of narcotics in kids. 
almost half in like every category. So it worked. So good job, pediatric surgery. We have decreased the amount of narcotics we've prescribed. Keep up the good work. Check out the link below. You heard Dr. Pomsky. Check the link in the description below to read each paper. We hope you liked this episode. Please follow us on social media, give us a rating, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to download our Stay Current app on App Store or Play Store for more content. Thank you for listening.